Um, yeah, okay, so I work at the Australian Antarctic Division. I actually work with a lot of managed data. I work with a lot of unmanaged data. I work directly with a lot of researchers on all kinds of data, like raster, very complicated net CDF physical model output, um, lots of remote sensing, lots of random stuff from the field in all kinds of formats and dimensionalities. Um, stuff we collect on voyages and stuff people measure in the atmosphere and stuff people collect off animals. Um, we have a huge array of kinds of data and what I've really learned is that I need meshes all the time and the more I learn about them, the more power I'm, I'm getting and there isn't a kind of a general framework for them that I can find. We let, we let go a lot of, of a lot of stuff with old topology GISs. Um, we weren't ready for triangulations, it was really hard. And I think we've left meshes behind. Um, but we're getting back to them now with computer graphics and it's becoming a lot more accessible. Um, so the major questions I'm talking about are what are meshes in topology um, and what are the relations of them to raster and vector data in the, in the, tr the usual way we treat them. So, and terminology is really hard here. Like when I say topology, I mean something particular. I don't mean the GIS meaning of it that has become established. Um, what I mean is, is the shape of things and their relationship. So we can forget about geometry completely and topology is, you know, is it a, is it a bowl or a cup? You know, it's actually what is the relationship of pieces and shapes to each other. The geometry is, is really in the raw, the where of things, and it's, it could be where it is in longitude, latitude, it could be where it is on a geocentric globe. That's kind of independent of the shape of the data. <coughs> um, and then indexing is what links those two together. So when you look at, at computer graphics, you are always going to be dealing with, with data this way. It actually separates the primitives, the topology, into a data set and it separates the vertices, the geometry, into another data set. And it actually is a pretty neat way to operate because you get a lot of cool things for free that way. And you get to make some cool 3D visualizations as well. When I say indexing, I mean two data structures relating to each other, not the technical speed up indexing in databases. Although they're related, I think. Um, so topologies. I've got a great typo there. Topology is not geometry. Um, and topology, topology emerges as, as an index into geometry. So this is about the most code I want you to look at in detail. Um, in R, I'm creating a three-dimensional matrix of geometry. So there's three points, and they exist in X, Y, Z. And they don't have any structure. There's nothing that tells me how to link them together. They're not ordered. They're just there. Um, but if I want to link them together as a pair of line segments, I actually build an index of start and end vertices. So 0, 1, start and end. And I have two. So it's the first two rows of my geometry define a one line segment, and then the second two defines the next. What's neat about that is I don't have to store the coordinates twice, even though one's shared between two line segments. <coughs> and in some ways, that's what topology meant in, in old GIS too. Um, if I want to treat exactly the same data as a triangle, I don't have to do anything to the geometry. I'm just creating a new index, and this time there's only one primitive, but it addresses all three coordinates in the right order. Um, and when I plot that with the magic of OpenGL, you can see exactly the same Geometry is now shared between two versions of the topology, and that's, that's all that really means. And this is a bit controversial, I guess, but I, I, I see these things are wrong with spatial about the way we, we do some of the things we do. Um, we confuse topology and geometry. We confuse topological dimension and geometric dimension. So. Um, and polygons are really just lines, like technically they're lines. There's magic tricks that go on to define the inside and the outside and to visualise the inside and the outside. And they're kind of magic tricks and we don't really have access to them at, at higher levels. 
And that last one, that's hard, right? That's really hard. I've met people who know how to do that. There's not many in the world, and it's, but it is accessible now. We do have access to libraries that can do it. Um, I'm motivated by lossless raster reprojection. So all those kinds of data I have to do constantly. I often have to preserve quantities, not just resample data across projections. I use projections all the time. Um, not just for presentation, but for analytical reasons, because they, they have all kinds of excellent analytical properties. Um, I'm interested in using them for topological fixes and neighbour classifications. Like That kind of comes out when you treat data in this way. Um, it's not a main focus of what I'm doing, but it's helped me to understand what's going on. Um, I have to work with a lot of track data and point clouds, and GIS has tended not to be able to do that. We still we have a, a, plethora, a plethora of ways of going about track data and point cloud, and we have some emerging principles, but it's still something that was left behind by GIS. It doesn't, it doesn't work in simple features. Um, and I'm motivated by three-dimensional and four-dimensional visualizations, because we have really complex high-dimensional data. Um, and immersive experiences like virtual reality are now really helping us bring the accessibility of these technologies. Um, and it's really about jumping the chasm from this geospatial into computation, uh, to computational graphics, computer graphics. Um, and what is a raster at root? You know, there's, there's two ideas. There's two, there's two implicit interpretations, and we can switch between them. It doesn't really matter. One is a, a discrete cell that has a constant value across it. And the other is a sort of a sample of a point that has a value and that implicitly varies across the field. Um, we get a bit tied up in knots when we try to apply this interpretation over here, but we don't really care normally because the, the half cell doesn't matter. But I think technically you can't... <laughs> You can't treat this as continuous in any sensible way. Um, and what is a polygon? Like, in one sense, it's a, it's a series of grouped paths. And that's all it is. That's actually the data. That's all we have. We trace those coordinates around in whatever the right direction is. <laughs> I, I think my reading, of, I thought it was clockwise, but what you said, I think, is exactly right. It's sort of both to not matter, but the right angle, yeah, and it matters in the tricks in the graphics card, yeah. But what this doesn't give me, this simple features representation, doesn't tell me that there's a shared edge between these two features, and that bugs me. Right? I can ask the geometry library what its neighbours are, but it doesn't tell me about the edges. It tells me who's a neighbour. You know, it gives me simple features back, and I want this graph. Um, so the other thing about the trick, you know, like if we if we want to represent this in 3D, we've actually got to really fill it. You know, we can't just pretend it's filled in 2D, um, and we can't use this trick in in 3D graphics, and we can't use a, that trick in in some analyses. Um, and so. Polygon triangulation, it's really hard. Um, it has a lot of complicated implications, like a triangulation of that polygon that didn't insert new vertices along the edges would, is really ugly triangulation. <coughs> um, this actually holds to the Delaunay criterion, and it has a maximum area of a triangle property that I've told the very complicated library that I used to do it to preserve. Um, but it's nice. It's a nice looking triangulation. It, it can be as dense as I want it to be. Um, and I kind of let go, I have to sort of let go of simple features completely because I don't want to store every vertex four times for every triangle. But when I separate the geometry and the topology, it's actually a really efficient way to do things. Um, I got a tiny bit about when things go wrong, and I was glad that um, this was named before it's called a spike. I didn't have a name for it. This is a degeneracy on this polygon, so there's a, 
a line with no area coming off the end of the yellow polygon. And um, if I ask GOS or LWG on, I'm not sure which one it is, if the second polygon is valid, it's like, no, it's not. I'm like, okay, what's, what's wrong with it? Um, one thing I can do is I decompose this to edges, and if I know the vertices, I know which ones, I can actually find those degeneracies. Um, not all degeneracies come out this way, like, like for loops that intersect, you'd have to triangulate, um, and it's not clear what you should do. In this case, you can just delete that, that vertex or those two degenerate edges. Um, and this is, you know, this is code I have in R to do that. So from the unique vertices, we had this degenerate polygon. And I was hoping it highlighted a bit, but you can basically see we go from 13 to 15, and we're all good. And then we go 15 to 14 and 14 to 15. And we can detect that. So if we've decomposed the edges, we can actually find that case. Um, and lots of other properties about storing this index to these edges. Um, that means open up R and run some code. So, <coughs> these aren't the greatest three dimensional plots in the world, but they're, they're designed to show that this code is available and we've, we're working on it and it works um, and it's really easy to do if it works. I've got to do some sort of kind of preparation with the, the HTML environment so that it knows to build an OpenGL widget. And you know, there's a lot of packages there that I have no idea about technology that I don't understand in detail. But this is the kind of eponymous raster matrix volcano in, in R, represented in an open, OpenGL widget. Um, and what I've done is actually treated the raster as cells as a mesh. And so there's a set of vertices, they're indexed by four, they're four vertex indexes per, per cell, and that translates straight into graphics uh, data structures, it's quite simple. The next one is actually a little piece of E-topo, very, very heavily decimated and cropped to the southern hemisphere. And I'm <coughs> again turning it into a quad mesh, um, and plotting it with material properties that show the elevation in situ. So I've cropped a tiny bit of very, very coarse E-topo and cropped out our region of the world um, and plotted that up. Lots of kind of interesting problems come out of this because you, if you do it in long lat, you'll have this ridiculous Z scaling factor with metres versus unprojected coordinates. Um, and so lots of map problems come at you in different ways. And for a long time, I didn't think I could do this at all because I just wasn't seeing what was in the scene, probably. Um, this one is now, I actually triangulate a polygon layer. And I copy down values off a global DEM raster. I'm doing it across a couple of projections, like I can kind of just handle that metadata internally. And then I plot up the counties of North Carolina, I think it's the GRASS GIS example data set, with the elevation of the background of that state. So there's, there's mountains in North Carolina. You know, I didn't really know the shape of North Carolina until I made this plot. And I'm really interested in the, that's the continuous case. So you need a lot of triangles per, count, per county to carry that, that shape. Um, but if, we, if we're simply copying down a discrete value, we don't actually need nice triangles. We just have one constant value for each polygon, which is the next plot. Um, and this is actually a value that's measured against that county. I think it's the SIDS rate for 1979. And it, it actually showed me that I actually have to break the mesh, right? Because now we're unique in XYZ and not, in, not unique in XY. So it's a different, you know, 
a completely valid different interpretation of what 3D means for a polygon. Um, the final one's a little bit more showy. And it takes our e-topo, turns it into a quad mesh, projects it onto the XYZ coordinate system for the globe, and then puts a texture image on top. And what I find really neat is this computer graphic stuff is really powerful, like for looking at and exploring our geospatial data. It's, and it's, it performs really well when you have a local OpenGL device. Doing it through the web all the time is a pretty, um, it's too slow for my, my needs. But so there's a rough little globe with relief on it, so the sort of relief of Antarctica there. As always, so there's a problem with the seam at the anti-meridian because it's always <laughs> a total pain in my life. Um, but that's actually the, the DEM with an image textured on. Um, so that's me for today. Thank you. So you're doing stuff in R. Are people doing meshes in other languages? Um, I find it really hard. Like the, the really advanced stuff is really like abstract. You know, I, I think the most powerful stuff is the C gel library. <laughs> Um, that's too hard for me to use yet, but I'll, I'm going to get there. Um, it, it turns up, it actually turns up in a lot of different places, but there's no consistent culture around it. You know, it's like little pockets and subcultures. That's my reading of it. Any more questions? Yeah. What's, the, what's the killer app for meshes that's going to make everyone go, we need meshes now? Ah, well, we'll stream down Mapbox. RGB DMs and texture images onto them and plot them in 3D for anywhere you want. So we're, we're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, one of the users, but it's not of this kind of mesh, it's been, um, you see the windy PV and similar weather apps with uh, the, the vectors for wind and temperatures and so on. It's actually a, a really nice application. Yeah, but, uh, Visualization of scientific output, it's, it's really hard. We just can't do it very well. Processes. Yeah. yeah, it's more of a sort of a use case because I'm mean, <coughs> in the construction industry and we're actually using meshes for like 3D modeling and stuff like that as well. So um, use like FME to convert CAD data and push it into like mesh data and stuff like that. So 3D modeling and BIM and stuff like that is pretty big for the meshing. Yeah. So not just the, I, I, I feel like it's like it's like the world partition around these big corporations, like, and I don't know. I don't understand why it's so distinct. You know, yeah, it just seems to be controlled by technology masters, and it's opening up for us. Yeah, for everybody. but the meshes are really like the true three D analysis because at the moment with the surfaces and stuff like that, you've got the extrusions. They're only really like two point five D. But the mesh gives you proper 3D analysis. So within um, PostGIS, with that 3D mesh um, library, you can do proper 3D intersections and things like that, and then analysis and cross sections and stuff like that. So um, yeah, it's like I've just been working in construction for the last two years, but it's just massive how you know how much information you can get out of it to, for what you know use cases and what people. Well, need. mechanical engineering with aircraft parts and things like that, they're using meshes. So, yeah, know, I mean, this is going to be going to be volumetric as well. Yeah, you're only using suits. Okay. Yeah, that's right. But it generalises to n dimensions because the right. primitives just yeah. you add another column. So I think structural analysis uses meshes, but I don't know what libraries are here. What I've been reading about is Fortran. Sorry. I answered the question about libraries. Um, QGIS three four has got mesh support built into it now, and part of that was building up. MDAL, MDAL, mesh abstract data abstraction, like, but like a bit like GDAL. So it's <coughs> meant to be eventually like open source like GDAL so that other apps can consume mesh like data basically straight out of the box without having to worry about all the yeah. finer details. So it's future for at least, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, I, re I should have mentioned MDAL actually. I'm not quite ready for it, but yeah, yeah I've been excited. Not quite. I've been excited to see it. Yeah. 
I believe Angle was quite inspired actually by his movie. Yeah. 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 All right, any more questions? One. Are these meshes compatible with uh, what have you used 3D tiles and meshes and 3D tiles, tile structures? No, I don't understand them yet. Yeah, but <coughs> so we can talk to anyone about that. Yeah. I haven't looked enough, I don't get it. Oh. Yeah, they, I think the 3D tiles use a sort of object modeling, which is a mesh type sort of rendering and stuff like that. So, so the tile's just the index, but then within that tile is the actual model which gets rendered. Yeah. So you get yeah. different levels of, of detail. So yeah. it sort of works in that sort of way, I guess. I don't even like what the movie is.